Uh, Kashid, if I, if I could ask you to weigh in on the questions that I laid out, basis what uh, uh, Mr. Nijjar's son told the Vancouver Sun. Why was he, if he was meeting Canadian intelligence officials virtually once or twice a week, A, why did he not have any kind of police protection? And B, what were these intel folks doing, hanging around a guy against whom there was a, an Interpol red corner notice? Well, let me start out by saying there's a lot of misinformation that's out there right now. There's a lot of allegations, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are being played out at this particular time. We have several people under threat in Canada, whether it's related to criminal organization or criminal activity or some other type of activity. Police forces and police agencies, intel agencies, have an obligation to inform people when they receive information that there's a public safety risk to them. And they're obligated to share that information with them, but that's all they're obligated to do. They're not really necessarily obligated to offer them protection just to give them some advice and give them some uh, comfort that uh, they're aware of this to a certain extent. you got to remember, and I've done this before in notifying people that they're under threat, is people will continue with their daily patterns of life. They think they're invincible and nothing's going to happen to them. And we're, that's a common uh, practice with a lot of people you advise that are under threat. Mm -hmm. So again, we only have Nidra's son who's going through probably some post-traumatic uh, stress as a result of his father dying, but there's, you know, people are amplifying some of the things that are happening. We don't know that that's factual. We're, we're making some assumptions there and we're speculating on what may have occurred. But I can tell you right now, law enforcement has a duty as imposed in Canadian uh, law here and uh, with our court system, and they undertook that particular duty that they had. They no, don't so necessarily. What about the second part of my question, Mr. Heath? Uh, what stop the individual? Yeah. What, what about the second part of my question? What were these intel folks doing, hanging around a person against whom there was an Interpol red corner notice, virtually once or twice a week, as per what his son uh, told Canadian media? It's regardless of what your. Uh, uh, you know, propensity uh, for violence may be or whether you're under some type of other allegation here, they still have the obligation to notify that individual that they are part of uh, intelligence that's indicating there may be a threat to their life, regardless of what your background is. Even if you have an Interpol red corner notice against you? Even if you have an Interpol uh, notice against you, a red flag. Okay. Vivek Kaju, do, do, do those answers convince you on both these counts? Because, uh, you know, our viewers are watching this and I leave it to their be better judgment, but I find it rather bizarre on both of these counts. If, he, if indeed he had threats to his life, as is being claimed, why was he not given any, any security? Here in India, if someone, particularly a public figure, if he or she is, uh, there is credible intelligence to, to back that he or she has a threat to his or her life, then you give them security. That's what you do. Uh, so why was that not done in this case? Does the answer from Mr. Heed, uh, you know, add up? And two, the question about, you know, you have an Interpol red corner notice against you, and yet these guys are not uh, arresting him, which uh, my understanding is uh, anybody who's a signatory and who's part of the Interpol uh, group of countries, uh, you are mandated, the law enforcement in that country is mandated to arrest such and such a person if there is a red corner notice. Uh as far as your first observation is concerned, uh, it concerns uh, really Canadian practice and uh, Mr. Heed is in a better position to answer that. Uh, maybe it is their practice not to give protection. Uh, in India, certainly, if there are there is credible, uh, credible uh, indication or credible information that the life of a person is under threat, then there there is an obligation on the part of the state agencies, security agencies, uh, to give some kind of protective cover. But what is the Canadian practice? Uh, it is for Mr. Heath to answer, and practices differ from country to country. Uh, and uh, now, the now the one? second, yeah. now yeah. the second part of your question is the most is, as far as we are concerned, a serious question, and it goes to the very heart of uh, the issues between India and Canada. And that is that the Canadian system simply does not as yet, simply has not as yet taken Indian concerns regarding uh, Khalistani 
supporters, people against whom there are terrorist charges, seriously enough. And uh, the fact that there was a red corner notice against Niger in the normal case should have activated the uh, law enforcement system in Canada to take yep. action in accordance with that red corner notice. But this is not the first case in which the Canadians mm -hmm. have not taken our concerns seriously. It seems to me that the Canadians have serious, their justice system, the law enforcement system seems to have serious doubts about the validity of the cases that we make out and the court orders that are given out. That is why they don't seem to respond as they should respond. And hence, in a recent article that I wrote, which was carried in a national newspaper, I've uh, suggested that there is great need now for mature diplomacy, for a real conversation on all these aspects okay. between India and Canada, because still now it seems over the decades, starting right from the 1980s or even earlier, the Canadians and we have been talking sort of past each other. Yeah. We have not engaged. Uh, Mr. Heat would be in a better position to answer this. But the Niger, there was, all this was building up, and the Niger case provided a trigger. All right. In fact, because that's what Omar that Aziz, uh, he was a former foreign policy advisor to Trudeau, he said exactly this, that uh, India and Canada and officials uh, in the meetings that he was part of were talking past each other on the Khalistan issue right. and not necessarily to yes. each other. But let me ask uh, Michael Kugelman, who's also joining us, uh, the response from the United States, it's been sort of middle of the road, whoever's spoken publicly, whether it's Jake Sullivan or Anthony Blinken, they've said, yes, we're concerned about it. We'd like India to cooperate with Canada, you know, uh, in these investigations and, and, and bring to justice uh, if at all such a thing has happened. N no one, no U.S. official has sort of taken a public stand or, or, or condemned India on this. And right now, in a couple of hours from now, I believe there's a meeting between uh, Mr. Blinken and uh, Foreign Minister Dr. Jay Shankar there in Washington, D.C. I think the moot point, everything is sort of the focus now seems to be Michael Kugelman on what's the evidence. Yes, Mr. Trudeau's made these, you know, very dramatic and very public allegations, but it's been 10 days now. What's, what's he got to back up those allegations with? Well, you know, once uh, Trudeau uh, made the decision to go public with the allegations, uh, he took a big risk because, uh, you know, he's, he's, he knew he had to know he was going to face pressure both domestically uh, and in India and elsewhere um, for, for him to put out uh, more evidence. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, here in Washington, you're right. The response has been very measured. Uh, you know, Washington has made clear that um, it takes these allegations seriously, and it's publicly said it wants India to uh, cooperate with Canada in the investigation. But this is just a very difficult spot that the U.S. government is in. It doesn't want this. It doesn't want to be in this spot. The crisis is very uh, problematic uh, for the U.S. because it's caught between a, a treaty ally and a strategic partner. And quite frankly, uh, you know, had had Canada made these allegations against pretty much any other country, you would see a very different uh, U.S. Uh, response, much less uh, much less uh, measured. But you know, the New York Times, among other outlets here in the U.S., reported that um, the United States, through the Five Eyes uh, Alliance, the Intelligence Alliance, uh, shared information um, with um, with Canada that um, contributed to uh, Canada's decision to. Uh, to, uh, to accuse India of possible involvement. So you know, the U.S. has likely seen uh, some of the same type of intelligence that, um, that, that Canada has been able to, uh, to gather as well, and yet it still remained quite, quite measured and quite restrained in its, um, in its public response. Bottom line, you know, I think that for all this talk of how we need to see the evidence, you know, I think that Canada and other countries would be very careful uh, not wanting to compromise intelligence tactics and methods used. I think that you know the, the Canadians would be very careful about putting evidence out there in the public uh, realm. If anything, we could see some selective leaks, perhaps, to the Canadian media. There's already been some of that. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think you're going to see uh, Ottawa come out with uh, with the evidence that everyone is asking to see.